Hello, this is Deborah Anderson, the Black Woman Animator, coming back to you with another video. And in this video, I have Dave Fanoy. Welcome. Hey, how you doing, Deborah? Thank you for inviting me on. Thank you. So can you give a quick intro about yourself? Well, uh, I was born. Uh, I, <laughs> By the I, river. Uh, I was, born, <laughs> in, in <little> shag. <laughs> um, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, grew up there. Um, I was a, at the time, Negro firster to a boys private school. So I grew up in the hood, but I went to a, a very good school. Um, I was interested in theater and music. Uh, went to school first for theater, then for music. Uh, toured around as a musician for a number of years, then became a disc jockey when I got married, had a kid and realized that I wasn't going to grow up to be a music star after all. Mm -hmm. um, moved to California and got into radio. And radio, after 10 years, brought me to voiceover in Los Angeles. And uh, since 1990, I've been in Los Angeles doing voiceover, cartoons, video games, TV promos, commercials, narrations. Uh, and now, although I still do all that, I also teach. Nice. Thank you for that. So you already said that you're from Cleveland, Ohio. Can you talk about how it was growing up? Well, one of my earliest childhood memories was wondering why my parents settled in Cleveland. Why couldn't we be in a real city like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles? Um, Cleveland was it was ha was having a, a, a was troubled then. Uh, mm -hmm. The Cuyahoga River was a fire hazard, and uh, not only were there race problems between blacks and whites, but the Lithuanians didn't like the Poles, who didn't like the Italians, who didn't like the Germans, who didn't like. So uh, I always felt like Cleveland was a mess and I couldn't wait to get out of there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was glad to go <laughs> when I got out of high school. Cool, so um, was it obvious in your childhood that you would end up doing something like voice acting? Well, you know, in some ways, I, I don't feel like I was as self-aware as a lot of people say, so, you know, my sister, for instance, who at three years old decided she was gonna be a doctor, never wavered from that path, and now she's a, a well-known doctor in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, I was just kind of living life, enjoying. I went out and played and played sports. I played football and baseball and ran mm -hmm. track, and I was interested in theater. My parents uh, put me in uh, Caramu House. Uh, anyone from Cleveland or any black actors you see on television or movies from Cleveland spend some time at Caramu House. Mm -hmm. uh, and there I I did fencing, I did music, I did modern dance, I did acting. So I was always interested in those things, um, but I didn't really know what I was going to do. It was, I was living year by year, day by day, Forced mm -hmm. my parents to say, son, you are going to college. You are going to have a career. Uh, so that was pounded into my head. Uh, and once I got into high school, I, I knew it was either theater or music. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize at the time it could have been both. Hmm. <laughs> so, um, so I guess you were kind of floating. So you didn't really know your original path or dream before voice. Well, I guess it was music. <laughs> so can you talk about um, your your try at doing music? Well, I, it was it was a pretty good try. I was a singer songwriter. I had bands when I was in high school. Um, we would play at parties and whatnot. And um, then I, when I went to college, uh, first college I went to was uh, McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. I went as a theater major, but I brought my guitar and early. Uh, somebody asked me to play at some event uh, I did, and from there it was, oh, let's play in this coffee house. Let's play at that coffee house. And, and of course, being a, a singer-songwriter, all the girls loved me, so uh, I had a lot of incentive to keep that up. Um, and I felt like that was my path this, at that point despite the fact that I was a theater major and I was doing uh, plays. Um, in theater. I was also playing football, so uh, I was a busy guy. <laughs> right. But uh, after a year and a half, I decided I needed to go on the road. There were some opportunities that came up. Uh, so I quit school, went on the road as a musician. 
uh, traveled around the country, uh, did a lot of playing on the East Coast, did some playing in Europe, um, and then came back and I decided to finish up uh, my education in college, went to Howard University, uh, became a jazz studies major. Uh, there I uh, met a woman, got married, had a kid, um, and uh, she was working on her master's and we moved to California uh, once we were out of school. And mm -hmm. um, at by that time, yeah, I had had bands the whole time I was in DC, we were playing around DC and even recorded an album that none of the companies wanted. Uh, so I decided to go into radio. And mm -hmm. at that point, because I thought, oh, this will keep me close to music. And we moved to California, Northern California. Mm -hmm. uh, she finished up school uh, and I began a radio career. Uh, and I ended up being a morning jock at a couple of the R&B stations in town. Uh, first, uh, KDIA, KDIA, the boss of the bay. And then KSOL, 107.7, KSOL. And I was working under the name Billy David Ocean. Nice. <laughs> they have radio name. When I when I first got on the radio, the KSOL station, I, I went from there to KDIA and back to KSOL. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a Dave Padilla doing news and Dave Gilton doing news. And the program director said, uh, we don't need another Dave. And he dubbed me Billy Ocean. Mm -hmm. Some years later, when I was doing mornings at the station, the singer Billy Ocean showed up and I got tired of the calls. Yo, man, I, you know, I like your record, dude. And I was like, no, it's not me, brother. That's not me. Uh, but he's, he's Billy Ocean, aren't you, Billy Ocean? Yeah, but, you know, we just have the same name. <laughs> right. And so how can that be? And so what's your name? Fred Johnson. Well, Fred, do you think there's another Fred Johnson anywhere on the planet? So... <laughs> Uh, I added Billy David Ocean, got a little bit of the real me in, <laughs> right. in there, um, and finished out my career doing that. In 1990, the station, as radio stations are wont to do, fired me and the entire staff. Wow. Uh, we were replaced uh, some, and uh, I said, oh, uh, this is my opportunity to move to Los Angeles and do voiceover as I had been studying voiceover for a while uh, at that time. And I had taken a, a course and the person who taught the course, Lee Gilbert, she was an agent at SBV at the time, Sudden Barth and Venari, my first mm -hmm. agent. Um, after this weekend course, she handed me her card and said, you know, you're really talented. If you ever decide to come to Los Angeles, we'd like to represent you. Uh, so I took her card and put it in my pocket. Of course, at that point, I was morning guy at the number one station in town, 107.7 KSOL. Mm -hmm. uh, and three months later, I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm looking for her card. I know I put it in a drawer or something here, found the card, gave her a call. She said, yeah, come on down, get a new demo. Uh, so I put together a new demo. They fired me February 9th, 1990. Not mm -hmm. that I recall. Uh, <laughs> And uh, three months later, I was uh, commuting back and forth to Los Angeles uh, from the Bay Area to uh, begin a voiceover career. And I, I mentioned that part because oftentimes people think it's good. I want it, so it's going to be handed to me. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I grew up with my mother saying, son, you're black. You're going to have to work twice as hard to get half as much. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew that. Uh, but even sometimes people knowing it, I don't think they realize sometimes what your commitment has to be. Yeah. I I drove up and down the five here in California between the Bay Area and Los Angeles for about eight months. I would drive down on a Sunday night or a Monday morning. I would drive back on a Friday night or, or Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. And um, first I stayed with a buddy of mine from high school who was living there for a month. Then I stayed with uh, an aunt and uncle of mine mm -hmm. uh, for a month. And uh, then I got an apartment uh, with a buddy of mine from Northern California who was trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, things went pretty well. And uh, I moved my family down. We bought a little house in Pasadena. Nice. And, uh, and the rest is history. 
Yeah, I understand. Like my commute was a little less. <laughs> um, <laughs> like when I lived in New Orleans, I commuted to Baton Rouge, which was like 110 miles a day. <laughs> Baton Rouge. Uh, <laughs> yes. So I, because I, it's like, you know, people who like New Orleans don't really like Baton Rouge and people who like Baton Rouge don't like New Orleans. You so know, that's, like, it, that's interesting because yeah. people in San Francisco in the Bay Area don't like people from Los Angeles. Uh, although people from Los Angeles are like, oh man, I love the Bay Area. It's great. Uh, but in Los Angeles, uh, in, in, in the Bay Area, I mean, they uh, look down on Los Angeles. I think it's jealousy. <laughs> they would like to have the entertainment industry that uh, Los Angeles has. Probably. So when you initially mentioned how you first dropped out of school, I immediately thought black parents. So what was your what was your parents' journey through like all of your decisions? Well, let's let's just say they were not happy about that. Mm -hmm. But my I, I I have had interesting parents. I, I think they were great. Mm -hmm. Um they were very strict. Uh, but not really judgmental. They mm -hmm. wanted me to do what I wanted to do. And somehow, despite the fact that they didn't really want me to drop out of school and go on the road as a mus musician, mm -hmm. um, they didn't come hard trying to make me stop or make me uh, feel bad for doing what I did. Mm -hmm. They loved They loved me anyway, I'm sure. Uh, these, these were people who didn't really get in your business. Mm -hmm. uh, I was living in a world that maybe they didn't quite understand, uh, but they had prepared me for, mm -hmm. which I think is a great um, lesson uh, for parents. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we always have thoughts about what our kids are going to do, uh, but they're growing up in a world different than the world you grew up in. I, yeah. I didn't have to go through some of the racial things that my mother and father went through. I mm -hmm. had to go through my own racial things of, mm -hmm. and racial things of my time, just like right. our kids are going through the racial things at this time. Racism is gone, but right. how how life shows up has yeah. changed a little bit. So the navigation of it is, is a little different. Uh, the things that they're trying to keep you from, uh, mm -hmm. uh, some of them may be the same, like voting, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but... <laughs> How they're how they're doing it, how it shows up, um, yeah. and is 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 different. So we have to. We, there are more of us who are middle class, educated, um, in good jobs. We're showing up in a wider variety of places uh, in the work world. So it's not that racism is gone, mm -hmm. but but we're in a little different world, and yeah. you have. I don't have to navigate it the way my dad did. You know, right. and and he managed to become a very successful man. He was a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we almost went broke uh, when I was a little kid because he was the first black veterinarian to have a private practice in Cleveland. And of course, that was in the hood. Mm -hmm. And we weren't taking our dogs and cats to the vet until it was damn near too late. <laughs> uh, so he ended up working for USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, and became mm -hmm. a foreign programs officer, traveled the world. Uh, and retired. Uh, when he retired, he was in charge of uh, meat inspection in South America. Okay. It didn't make him a rich man, but it made him mm -hmm. a successful man. And my mother was a su successful educator, mm -hmm. a reading specialist, uh, first in Cleveland and then in Maryland. So um, come from an educated family, uh, mm -hmm. a, fam uh, a humble family that worked hard, and yeah. sacrificed so that uh, uh, my sister and I would have a great education. Yeah, that's good. When you talk about um, like parenting, I remember maybe several months ago seeing some lady tweet about how her child went into art and became, and then you know became unsuccessful because you know some parents think art is automatically unsuccessful. But then I was like, if you decide to like if you if your child goes into a a path and you don't support them as much as you would if they would have been a doctor or a lawyer what can they do except fail like if they succeed that's in, in despite in you <laughs> like so you know i i i, I think uh, people uh, succeed despite their parents whether their parents support them or not mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, sometimes even when your parents are supporting you and trying to do everything they can, you don't mm -hmm. succeed. Some, you know, a parent can do too much or do the wrong things. Maybe it's just you. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I had parents that uh, I, I'm sure in their private conversations at home in the bedroom before they went to sleep, what, what, what's up with David? I appreciate it. Yeah. He's he's a musician now and he dropped out of school. What's he going to do? Oh, my God. But uh, <laughs> in the end, I'm, I'm very glad that I was able to show up successful and well-known in my field mm -hmm. uh, while they were still alive. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, you know, my mother used to, um, you know, she'd go, oh, I was at the beauty shop today and we heard you on, on CBS. You were doing promos for As the World Turns and Guiding Light. And I said, that's my boy. That's my boy. <laughs> black mothers always want to do that. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I don't think it's just black mothers, but definitely black mothers. <laughs> I remember my mom took me to church just to show me off, like to show how I grew up. Like, can you just come, please come to church with me? Oh yeah, I want to. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, my mother grew up in East Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, when my parents retired, that's where they moved to. And uh, my father being a veterinarian, they started a little cattle ranch, mm -hmm. uh, just a gentleman's cattle ranch. He had about 50 head, enough that a, a gentleman rancher could, could handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I'd go to visit, you know, same thing. Oh, we're going to take you to church on Sunday. We want to introduce you to people. Oh, I'm going into town. I got to stop by the the beauty shop and the this place and the that place. Well, turns out these were all places that my mom had talked about me and or my sister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had to be, oh, uh, Miss uh, So-and-so. Uh, nice to meet you. Oh, 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 Reverend So-and-so. How you doing? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Been there. Been there. So, um, well, let me list some of your um, your projects. This is a time where I try to let people know that some of our favorite programming um, had Black people involved. Um, your IMDb is like nonstop, so I'm only like doing some of them. <laughs> but I still say a lot. So, um, New Kicks. New Kids on the Block TV series. Um, you were Dick Scott, right? Dick Scott, I played the manager of New Kids on the Block. Yeah. Uh, Darkwing Duck, uh, Pro Stars, you were Bo Jackson, Various Voices in Aladdin, Where on Earth is Carmen San Diego, Sonic the Hedgehog, Ultimate Spider Man video game is Nick Fury, Various Benton um, properties, Saints Row video game, Laura Croft Tomb Raider anniversary video game as Ken Cold Cade. Mass Effect 2 as Warlord, uh, Okir, Ronald Taylor, Tarak, etc. Uh, World of Warcraft, Cataclysm as Prophet Zul. Uh, the LeBrons, which I actually worked on a little. <laughs> yeah, I played his lion. <laughs> oh, just the lion. So, like, when I was in Korea, um, my, my company worked on the LeBrons uh, when it was 2D. And there's like the opening with the kitchen, and I like did something with the refrigerator. <laughs> 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 so we have a connection. <laughs> well, I, was, I was LeBron's line. I was the coolest line in the world. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, Star Wars, the Clone Wars, as Pong Krell. Um, General Walker. Pong Krell. Yes. Okay, so this is your coup de gras, like the Walking Dead video game as Lee Everett. <laughs> we'll talk yeah. about that later. Um, okay. uh, Guild Wars 2 video game as Captain Raheem, Zam, 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 <laughs> Elder Sons there, etc. Um, World of Warcraft, Mists of, Mists of Pandor Pandaria video game, um, Assassin's Creed 3, Liberation, uh, The Wolf Among Us video game, Batman, Arkham Knight as Lucius Fox. Uh, Fallout 4 video game, uh, Gu uh, Guardians of the Galaxy TV series, um, Fantasy, Final Fantasy 15, The Elder Scrolls Online, M Moral Morrowind video game, OK Go, o OK KO, Let's Be Heroes TV series, Spider Man, Miles Morales video game, uh, Ruby TV series, etc. etc. Yeah. And <laughs> um, like etc. <laughs> so um, you know and and most people know me for video games although i do mm -hmm. some of everything in voiceover but uh i've been on about 500 video games yes 
<laughs> so what would you say is your was your biggest breakthrough in your career? And there could be multiple, but. Um... Uh, you know, I think uh, one of the big breakthroughs was having a great agent. Uh, mm -hmm. was because I studied and took a class with an agent when I was in Northern California uh, at a very good agency. Uh, I was discovered by that agency who then uh, tried to make sure I was discovered in the voiceover community in LA. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a big break. I, you know, and it's funny, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great believer in big breaks generally we see people the first time we see them and notice them oh that's so and so wow they just came onto the scene no they've been working hard for a long time yeah. and you know you it's 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 more like you you're walking up steps mm -hmm. and you finally walk up high enough that oh uh i can be you're seen the on clouds. the horizon <laughs> i'm above the clouds you know or or i'm high enough on these steps now people can see me yeah uh and <laughs> And from there, uh, if you're smart enough, lucky enough, talented enough, uh, you can keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've seen a lot of people that I started off with that uh, we were on the same rungs and have fallen by the wayside. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing, nothing is guaranteed. You still have to show up every day and, and really do your thing. Yeah. Yeah, even um, to go back to when you mentioned... Um how you commuted for eight months. Like I, you know, I'm in all these animation, Facebook groups, discords, all these groups. And it's kind of funny, like young people and maybe even older people <laughs> will be like, um, oh yeah, I've been trying this for like a year and a half and I'm about to quit. And it's like. So often that, you know, that right at the time that you quit, if you just stuck with it a few more days, uh, by the same token, I think sometimes uh, sometimes it is time to let something go. I think it was time mm -hmm. for me to let go of the music industry. When I went to Howard, I'd, I'd been playing music uh, all through my teen years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wasn't a bad guitarist. I just wasn't a great guitarist. Mm -hmm. um, and when I got to Howard University, uh, when I went back to school the second time, uh, Suddenly, I'm around some of the best musicians in the world. I, uh, Jerry Allen was there, one of my good friends still. Uh, uh, Wayne Lindsay, who okay. played with Miles Davis, played with Whitney Houston, uh, Tonight Show Band, American Idol Band. Uh, mm -hmm. These are the cats I'm around. Uh, and I was okay. These I, I played music. These people were music. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that uh, kind of let me know, you know what, um, maybe I'm meant for something else. Yeah. Uh, and, and I say that with the um, understanding that not all the famous musicians, not all the famous singers and whatnot uh, may have the musicianship, the knowledge of music that the people who back them up have. Right. You know, uh, that singer-songwriter who has this great band behind him and he's kind of strumming along and singing. Mm -hmm. He's okay. You love his songs. That's his talent and and maybe ever so wonderful at that. But the musicians playing behind him, mm -hmm. those are the real musicians. Mm -hmm. Well, I discovered uh, I was more this singer-songwriter who needed these guys. And mm -hmm. I just... Felt like I, you know, and it wasn't happening for me. So uh, I was married, had a kid. I realized, oh, the baby needs milk. She don't care where that milk comes from. I know. I'll go into radio. That'll keep me close to music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like um, I feel like I've experienced it before. I decided to move to Los Angeles, but um, the biggest thing I feel like is hard in adulthood is the difference between push and pivot because you're like don't take no for an answer but maybe i should do something and you know it's like a thin line where it's like what should i do i don't know and you know so sometimes I, we sometimes we have to find our way sometimes yeah. we have to find our way uh and and that is the mystery of life so yeah i thought new orleans was going to be my forever city and you know, we all we all see these like we all talk about these red flags in in 
person people to people relationships but mm-hmm. then there was there were these red flags in living in new orleans where it's like if i saw the red flags i might have moved in 2013 or 2015 but i was just like no i'm going to make it <laughs> and so i didn't move till last year so. but you know what um failure isn't failure it's a mm-hmm. lesson unless right. you allow it to be failure Right. You know, sometimes you you fail at something. Uh, well, let's put let's put it uh, glass half full. You you don't succeed at something, mm-hmm. uh, so that you can succeed at something else, or it teaches you a lesson. You know, and yeah. life gives us lessons, and uh, some of them we're going to learn, and eh, some of them we may never learn. Yeah, I definitely appreciate my mountain my valleys as much as my mountaintops. I'm not like a God, why me type person? I'm more of a, okay, this is a lesson. I can't wait for hindsight to be 2020 because, and and depending on how big the the valley and lesson is, I'm like, whoa, Lord, you prepared me for something awesome because this is terrible. (laughs) How do I get out of this ditch? (laughs) (laughs) But like, sometimes you're like, okay, you're in it. And you're like, okay, that's why I did that because now I I know how to do this, that, whatever so i'm like okay so that's why i did i went through that all right but not everything is gonna be 20 hindsight is not gonna be 20 20 all the time but you're gonna be like oh, okay i i perfectly understand why i went through that <laughs> there you go there you go um so how did you venture into video games you know what uh i stumbled into video games mm-hmm. i i was uh when i came in 1990 to la um i came mostly i was thinking about uh tv promos because that's what they suggested somebody coming out of radio because when you have that radio voice and you're doing that thing Mm -hmm. uh and the easiest transition from that is into uh tv promos so i was doing that but they also gave me some uh auditions for cartoons and Mm -hmm. as a kid I had done cartoon voices because I had watched cartoons Mm -hmm. and uh so I booked a few of those And along come these auditions for video games. Now, this Mm -hmm. is in uh, the 90s, late mid to late 90s. And this was when video games were just beginning to have voice actors in them. Mm -hmm. And I booked some things. Lucas Films had some games. um, And I booked a few things there. I was a pod racer. In mm-hmm. uh, one of their, the whole thing was in Hutties, one of the toughest jobs ever. Mm-hmm. And I started booking those, but I wasn't thinking of them so much as video games. I was thinking, oh, this is just another form of animation. Mm-hmm. Well, what I discovered later on is most of the cartoons I did uh, were adventure cartoons. Mm-hmm. So I'm playing heroes and villains. Mm -hmm. Um, and video games tended to lean more towards the drama and the adventure uh, than cartoons that leaned more towards the comedy. It's not to say that there's not comedy in video games or adventure in cartoons, but kind of a rule of thumb. Yeah. And uh, as the video game industry was growing through the late 90s and early 2000s, I was booking more games. Mm-hmm. I wasn't thinking about it as, hey, I'm getting into video games. I'd, hey, well, oh, another gig. Let me go do that. Oh, well, let me go do that. Well, uh, about 2010, 2011, uh, a guy sent me a video uh, demo he had put together of things I had been in. Mm-hmm. I had no idea I had been in some of the biggest games in the world, uh, <laughs> playing some major characters in these games. I. Mm-hmm. I wasn't a gamer, Mm -hmm. still not a gamer. Mm -hmm. Uh, But looking at that, I went, whoa, I didn't realize I'd been in so many games and wow, this stuff looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. I sent it over to my agent and she said, oh yeah, this is super. Let's let's turn this into an an actual demo. And he had offered, if you want to make some changes, please do. And I uh, made some changes, sent it back. Well, about a year later, the Walking Dead came came along in 2012. Mm-hmm. And immediately on the first session, I knew this was something different. I knew this was something uh, much better in terms of the writing, the content, 
uh, than things I had been doing in video games with, with the possible exception of some of the Lucasfilm stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that first 20 minutes of the session, I went, wow, this is special. And it, this was luck. And of course, uh, we know luck is uh, opportunity meeting preparation. So yep. apparently they had hired somebody else to play the part of Lee Everett. But uh, once they listened to that first episode, they went, mm, we need a better actor. And I had been on a, a Law and Order game playing a crooked politician uh, for Telltale Games. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a fellow that was working there uh, said, hey, we should get this guy, Dave Fenoy, to audition. Mm -hmm. um, a few days later, I had the audition, didn't send it in. And a few days later, they said, okay, you've got this part. Uh, we're going to start recording in a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, Telltale Games at that time was in Northern California. They would fly, they started flying me up. And this is a job that took, oh, most of a year to do. There are five episodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I they'd fly me up, put me up in a little hotel, a little town uh, um, in Northern California, mm -hmm. Fairfax, <laughs> uh, in Marin County for a couple of days. And I'd go in and we'd record all day. Uh, you know, so you'd record in the morning, go to lunch, then record in the afternoon, go back to your hotel room and come back, then fly you back down after a day or two. And then in a couple of three or four weeks, you had pickups to do or, or mm -hmm. uh, so they'd fly you up again. And this went on uh, for almost a year, eight or nine months. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it would, and as the episodes came out, I started uh just looking up, well, what, what's the industry saying? And I was, we were getting a lot of great press. Nice. But uh, they were talking about how wonderful the game was, how wonderful the voice acting was, but they weren't mentioning any names. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got in touch with I said, you know, I noticed you love the game, you love the voice acting, but you're not mentioning who the voice actors are. And yes, I was very interested in my name being there, <laughs> but uh, the entire cast was wonderful. So um, I, of course, mentioned me, but a lot of other names. And and uh, the reaction I got, which I thought was going to be, well, we don't care about the actors. We just want to, you know, talk about the game. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, great. Who are the actors? Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then the game got 100 Game of the Year nominations, mm -hmm. uh, or, or no, won about 100 uh, year, Game of the Year awards. Uh, mm -hmm. I was nominated for Best Performance in a Video Game a number of times, including a BAFTA. I got to go to London uh, nice. for the British Academy of Film and Television Arts. <laughs> uh, I did not win. Mm -hmm. uh, both uh, Melissa Hutchinson, who plays the little girl, Clementine, that I'm taking care of in this a video game and myself were nominated and uh some some english guy won for some other game and of course everybody came just wow if only one of you had been nominated you would have won but mm -hmm. <laughs> it was hard but, to choose well you know what um i understand what the actors who are nominated for emmys and oscars who say mm -hmm. it's an honor just to be nominated mm -hmm. because it really is Mm -hmm. If you've if you've made that, yeah, you want to win. But if you've been nominated, um, you've done something, and it kind of put me on the map now. Uh, not just as that character actor in these video games that we love his voice, but we don't don't really know who he is. To yeah. oh, uh, award winning, award nominated voice actor Dave Fenoy. Yeah. Um, and that I think opened up some doors. At the same time that the industry was continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the biggest entertainment industry in entertainment. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than movies and music combined, uh, video games, quiet as that's kept. You know, people that, who tend to be over 40 have no clue. <laughs> uh, but this is a, a multi-billion dollar industry. I think it took in like $130, $140 billion last year. Mm -hmm. um, it's a worldwide business. Uh, you have games that were created in English or German or 
whatever language and they're all being dubbed into other languages. So uh, I got a chance to go to Columbia for a voiceover conference. And uh, while I was there, uh, the two Latin voices who dub things that I do were there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did an overdub of, of my current demo with their voices. You know, they played mine first and then they played them dubbing it. I was like, oh, wow. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So it, it, it's a worldwide business. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's huge. Um, we're probably at the place in video games where actors were in sitcoms in the early 60s. Um, we're not getting the residuals that we should, uh, mm -hmm. but we're now getting a few bonus payments. And mm -hmm. uh, if you're like me, you can be in that category of, oh no, I work for double scale. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, and, and, and th this is, gives me a platform because you're talking to black animators and I just wanna say to the black, an black animators, I want to be on your project, man. Yeah. I'm, you know, I I want to do the stuff you're doing. The best stuff in the world is yet to come, and I would like to be part of it. Nice. <laughs> Don't because yeah, yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that happens, you know, you you get people. Yeah, well, I did this thing and I hired this guy and he was okay, but, you know, I really wanted to hire you, but I didn't want to insult you by offering you, you know, some work that I couldn't pay you. But so I'm like, dude, <laughs> we are, you know, musicians, actors, artists, mm -hmm. we're, we want money, but mm -hmm. we're not doing it for the money. Mm -hmm. We do it because we love creating these characters. We love playing that music. We love creating something for you to see and feel nice. that's what it's all about that's what's up um so what are some differences between like voice acting for tv film and video games um the differences in those genres yeah i feel like off the top of my head i could i could think of for games you have to do a lot of uh, <laughs> oh if, well, you know what? If you're going to ca do cartoons as well, you're gonna you're gonna have some okay. efforts. And if you're on camera, you're having efforts. It's just your efforts are going along with the body. Ah! Uh, uh, uh. Uh, we're seeing what happens uh, mm -hmm. it, when you're doing things that are animated, whether it's uh, animation uh, cartoon or animation video games. Mm -hmm. uh, those things still have to be put in. So now we're we're just putting them in and have to stay on mic while we're doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually don't think there's a lot of difference between uh, voice acting and on camera or stage acting. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest difference is uh, you're standing in front of a microphone and there are words on the page. You haven't memorized your script. Typically, especially in video games, there's not another actor that you're bouncing energy off of. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not have blocking. You may not see uh, the, the dialogue that you are responding to. Uh, so you have to make it up in your head. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, when you're on camera, uh, you, you have memorized your line. That's the other thing. You're reading words on a page as opposed to having memorized it. Mm -hmm. um, and just the the reading, oh, there's that word and that word and that word and that word, and I'm saying they put these things together. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a certain amount of, of brain power to see it, translate it, and then have it spit out of your mouth. Yeah. Um, when you've memorized it, it's a different process. Mm -hmm. So you have to A, become a better reader, mm -hmm. and B, be able to translate the written word into the spoken word. Mm -hmm. And we've all been in a class or someplace where somebody gets up to read. And once upon a time, there was a, well, that that's an extreme case of readiness. And what you want to be able to do, once upon a time, there was a da-da-da-da-da. Yeah. Uh, and just say it, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I am reading these words and I am trying to make sense of them. Uh, that takes a certain amount of brain power and practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so those are the things that are, are really different. And I tell people, look, 
The words have to be said. They're not as important as you think they are. What's important is the whole picture. So what's your, why is your character saying what they're saying? And you can say, I've done this so much. I've got hand signals. Why are they saying what they're saying? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? What are they doing? Who are they talking to? And what's that relationship? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and really do the script analysis to know what's happening in every scene. And yeah. video, video games are very different uh, than animation. You might see the whole animation script. You will never see the full video game script. Okay. It came out of the computer industry. They're very secretive. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't want you to know. Plus, uh, in video games, different things can happen to different characters based on what a player decides they're going to say and or do. Right. So uh, you, the arc of your character, it, well, there may be a number of arcs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, you kind of learn the arcs as you're doing it, but you don't know yeah. beforehand. And to me, that makes it very much like life. We know who we are. We know what our tendencies are, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't know what's going to happen to us every day. We make plans and God kind of scratches his beard, says, mm -hmm, or scratches her beard. No, we don't want to put a beard on a female guy. But, uh, you know, we don't know yeah. what's going to happen to us. We, mm -hmm. we, we have a plan. Uh, one day you, you know, everything's everything, your girl or gal gave it to you just the way you like, you got money in the bank, you got a raise at, uh, at your job mm -hmm. and somebody, Hey, how you doing? Oh man, life is, woo, it's a dream, baby. Mm -hmm. Uh, and another day your girl or gal left you, your money mm -hmm. gone, you get fired. What's going on? Oh man. <sighs> I wish I knew, <laughs> right. but you're the same person. Right. You're Even as simple as I remember I'd be in Korea going, watch it, riding on the subway and like looking at my face in the window. And some days I'm like, my face looks really nice today. And the other days I'm like, eh. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, face. and your face didn't change. It was your <laughs> attitude. Right. I'm just like, ah, ah, I'm, my face is phoning it in today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, my face is phoning in today. I'm so <laughs> Come on, face, do your thing. <laughs> so it's just like as simple as that. So just add in other people and this like emotions. <laughs> it's crazy out here. <clears throat> and you know, the actually thing, we also we all have buttons. Mm -hmm. And uh we being black folk, we got some buttons. But we can't live in those buttons every minute of every day. Yeah. Uh and neither can your characters. Mm -hmm. Uh so you you can't always play everything uh, that your character is about in every scene. Sometimes it's just, oh yeah, let me have a sandwich. No, yeah. uh, I'm gonna take it to go. <laughs> Sometimes it's as simple as that and understanding, I don't, let me have a sandwich. <laughs> I'll take it to go. Uh, it, it's understanding what we're doing as actors yeah. um, is a portrayal of humanity. Right. Uh, and so we, we kind of have to study humanity and learn to uh, allow our characters to be as real as possible. Yeah. Even when they're fantastical. <laughs> yeah. When you talk about not like playing the buttons all the time. Um, I remember several years ago, a woman wrote an article about um, she was a black woman and she decided to like actually respond to every microaggression and sh she was exhausted by the end of the day oh, yeah. like, we ignore so much stuff that we don't realize how much we're ignoring until you actively decide to respond to everything <laughs> uh you know and it's how do you live in this world somebody asked me i was being interviewed a, a few years ago mm -hmm. um and i work general market as well as ethnic mm -hmm. Uh, and fortunately, you know, when you look at the landscape of television, radio, and so forth, now you you see and hear us uh, <laughs> yeah. in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. uh, the the idea of what the American voice is has mm -hmm. changed. It's mm -hmm. it's black and white. Mm -hmm. It's Latin. It's mm -hmm. it's voices from other countries. Although, right. 
I'm a little upset with Idris Elba doing the Ford Mustang electric car commercial. I'm sorry. That needs to be an American voice, Idris. I love you, brother. I love you. And the read is great, but no, no. Who made American that American car. <laughs> so I know you've talked about in other interviews how um, Lee Everett was like a, a favorite character that you voiced. You already mentioned some reasons why um, it was so important. Are there any other reasons that you hadn't mentioned? Um, well, one, it was the first character that was really just my voice, mm -hmm. just really me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a daughter, uh, like everybody else walking the planet there. I have regrets in life for things mm -hmm. that I've done. Uh, and this was a character, more than anything, it's a redemption story. It's about a man mm -hmm. who... Uh, made a big mistake. He found his wife was cheating. He killed her and the, the, her lover. And they don't talk about this much. And as a matter of fact, in, in so many ways, I think it was more important for me as the actor to know that than the audience to know that. Mm -hmm. uh, he's on his way to jail. He thinks his life is over. He, he, he thinks he has ruined everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the zombie apocalypse frees him. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and he finds this little girl up in a tree uh, and takes on uh, the task of keeping her alive through this zombie apocalypse. And that redeems him. That gives him worth once again in his life. He had been a college professor and lost it all. And uh, it's a redemption story. Nice. So um, something that people might not ask you as much is, what is another character because um, you've done plenty. So is there another character that um, you like? Oh, to there, 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 there are quite a few. I love playing Volton, Volton, leader of the Horde from World <laughs> of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. got that. He's from, well, he's not from the islands, but he sounds like he's from the islands, man. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he, strong warrior, really dedicated to his people. Mm -hmm. uh, he becomes the leader of the Horde. Um, and, uh, he eventually is, uh, killed in battle, mm -hmm. but now he is a spirit and he's still mm -hmm. fighting for his people. Nice. Um, I love playing General Pong Krell, who, uh, was, uh, now that's a cartoon, uh, Star Wars or Clone Wars. Uh, he's, uh, Umbaran, um, which they have four arms. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a Jedi. And he's a traitor. He's a bad guy. Mm -hmm. but, I, but uh a lot of times playing the bad guys are the most fun. Um <laughs> and it, it just, you know, it's funny. I'm one of those actors. What I enjoy is the work, not watching the work after the fact. And I know a number of actors who feel that way, that you know, they're on camera, going down, down. Oh, I love doing the work. I don't want to see me in the movie. Uh, because we become very judgmental about, well, why'd they use that take? Oh, man, right. I could have done that better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. But the right. doing of the work, letting these characters speak through you, that, for me, yeah. that's, mm, that's it. Um, so I don't want to ask too many questions because I know you teach, but what, what is, um, what are some common mistakes that beginner animation voice actors might, may make? Um, usually the biggest one is I've come up with this great voice, uh, but then they've not come up with, uh, the background, the backstory, the worldview, uh, the foibles of of a particular character. You you want to flesh that out. You want to give them a history. Where are they from? What's their education level? Uh, are they smart? Are they not so smart? Mm -hmm. um, why, why are they the way they are? Uh, and get beyond just the voice. Uh, you got to be careful if you're doing accents. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times uh, actors will work really hard to perfect the accent, but then not be able to act within that accent. It's gotta yeah. be really second nature. By the time you're doing it, you can't think about the accent while you're acting. Right. It just, it has to be second nature to you. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing I, I, I call it playing the, uh, playing the words and not the character. Mm -hmm. 
uh, different characters are going to say things completely differently. How, well, the energy in how they say it is going to be completely different based on right. what their worldview is, who they are, what their educational level is, so forth and so on. There's so, so many criteria. And too often, people are trying to play the, what the words are. And, and they're giving it a song mm -hmm. instead of letting the character say it. Right. I uh, know another thing you said is the error of trying to make it all happen with your mouth. Yes. Uh, a director friend of mine said, well, you, your mouth is really uh, the exhaust on the acting engine. Mm -hmm. uh, all the other things happen first. Uh, that the If you were acting and you were going to be on telephone, what would you do? Yeah. Which have you seen? This is this viral like TikTok video, like this this thing where, uh, like people my age and older are asking their children like, how do you talk on the phone? And all the like Generation Z and younger kids are like, <laughs> so they don't even know. Yeah. This. <laughs> but but you know what? And hey, uh, different generations. I talked about that before. Uh, my life isn't your life. Yeah. Uh, you know, and my my kids' lives are not my life. Right. Uh, now, I happen to be sharing the same time with them. So, yeah, now I'm, you know, I'm doing the same thing. But actually, me, it's like this. Why? Because I got this thing in my ear. Uh, so how we do it is a little different. But still, yeah. our bodies inform our voices. So, uh if you're trying to think of what you did three weeks ago on a Tuesday, think about it. And and you're about to tell me, what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> it's innate. There are things that we do as human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to sound a little more important, all you have to do is sit up a little straighter. Mm -hmm. If you want to sound like you're really tired, then you can just kind of relax. And our body tells our mouth yeah. what to do. So mm -hmm. what are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, and those things will automatically bring the acting that you're trying to create here. If you're just standing there, arm at your sides, and and I'm going to make these words have some kind of meaning by how I say them, it's not going to happen. It's right. not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Something I like, uh, I'm not sure if it's like the Hollywood Reporter YouTube channel, but they have voice actors co come and watch other people trying to do their voices. So I've seen <laughs> like Lisa, like you know, the lady that does Lisa Simpson and other people. And they give really good like tips because people will just try to mimic this scene, but it's like you're not embodying the character and then they'll be like, oh, you got to pitch it up. Or they pitch it up in the studio so you can't ever sound like me. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, more often than not, it's somebody can get the voice down, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not getting the feeling down. Yeah. They're not, they they uh, suggest to like, okay, but can you do Bart Simpson or can you do this character not with the, 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 um, the like, dialogue from something can you just say can you just talk and do that voice that's what a lot of people oh yeah mimicking can't do and and one of the things uh one of the fun things that we used to do back when we could go to conventions mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of actors on stage playing a character that they've played doing something completely different reading some script that you know you're a comedy character reading something that's very serious Mm -hmm. uh, and those are a lot of fun. Yeah. But to do that, you really have to know who your character is. You have to have mm -hmm. what that character's voice down, and you have to have that character's worldview down. Yeah. Um, is it hard to remember all these characters and how you did them? <laughs> well, you know, um, when you think about it, I, I 500 or so video games, uh, you know, 50 or so cartoons. Uh, you don't necessarily remember all the characters you did until you hear them. You okay. know, when you've done an audition and they, you book the job and maybe you don't get that booking for a month or two, especially in okay. video games. Uh, mm -hmm. When you step in the studio, 
they play our audition back for you. And then it's it's kind of like your muscle memory. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that character. And they may do some adjustments with, you know, well, the character's worldview is this, da, 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 a little, let's change this up a little bit. But, um, and if you are doing a character that you continue to do, I've been doing Vol'jin from World of Warcraft for a decade or so. Mm -hmm. uh, every session, they play, uh, they play my performances of that character just to get it back in my head. I don't yeah. think I need it, but I, I never tell them no. I'm glad they do. <laughs> um, so th those things happen. But what you find is when you really are in the character, just hearing the voice puts you back in the in the frame of mind. So um, can I ask your opinion on the chatter around um, voice actors voicing characters that are a different race from them? Well, I'm glad that uh, we're finally realizing it's um, it. This is show business. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of actors, especially white actors, will tell you, "Oh, well, you know, we're actors, man. We're supposed to be playing characters that that aren't us." So I I should be able to play a black guy or Latin guy or Chinese guy because I'm an actor, man, and you know we're pretending anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's, this is also a business. The, the, this is a place that hires people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a believer that, hey, you got a, a role for an Asian guy, hire an Asian guy. You got a role mm -hmm. for a Latin woman, hire a Latin woman. You got a role mm -hmm. for a black person, hire a black person. Um, our, our white counterparts basically in this country are generic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there's plenty of parts for them. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. they they want everything, it seems, sometimes. Not everybody, but mm -hmm. uh, so many feel like, well, I want, I want everything. How come How come this black guy got the black part? Well, because it's a black guy. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to see that. I see auditions mm -hmm. now that come through uh, that if the character, uh, they say African-American, I say black. Uh, <laughs> But if the, if the part calls for a black actor, they're saying uh, they want a black actor. If it's calling for an Asian actor, they want an Asian actor. A Latin actor, they want a Latinx actor. Mm -hmm. uh, I I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I feel like, you know, if it's commentary on Twitter or something, they try to kind of reverse it. Like, oh, then why do these actors get to do white people? It's like, because y'all don't have diversity. <laughs> and if, 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 the, if the person's race is the only voice they would do, then they would have no work. <laughs> yeah, true. true. Y'all got plenty of white people. <laughs> yeah, you got plenty of white people. And uh, sometimes the character, it, it, the race doesn't matter. Sometimes it's just a doctor, just a fireman, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. a, a, a nurse, just a whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could be played by anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and in cases like that, it, we don't care what race. Mm -hmm. uh, for commercials, uh, we're seeing now uh, commercials that not only could be uh, any ethnicity, Mm -hmm. Because the American voice is not what they used to think of the American voice as, yeah. but it could be male or female. Mm -hmm. When I got in the business, I think about 11% of, of voiceover was uh, female in after, of mm -hmm. after jobs. Well, it's up around 50% if, if perhaps women are do, doing even more commercials than men now. But, and that's as it should be. Mm -hmm. That's as it should be, so. Right. Uh, what would you say, what can you say about the importance of networking in your career? Um, and what tips can you give that applies to the in entertainment industry? Uh, well, you know, I don't think of myself as the best networker in the world. Um, I was very naive when I got in the business. I did some uh, promotion, mm -hmm. uh, but I was a great believer in, well, my work speaks for itself, man. I don't have to do, but you do. Okay. You do have to advertise, let people know that you are there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I still feel like there is a line between uh, enough and too much mm -hmm. that too many people cross. Um, but you do have to remind the world that you exist, that mm -hmm. you were there. Uh, you must have a website 
these days. Uh, mm -hmm. It must display uh, who you are. You know, the branding word is out there. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, I think, are trying to brand themselves actually before they're ready to brand themselves. They don't quite know who they are yet. Um, but you do have to discover mm -hmm. who you are and what you do. And uh, one of the things that helps you with is not trying to be all things to all people. Yeah. Uh, understand that you have a brand, you have a sound, you have feel. Uh, and when they want that, that's what they want. I think about uh, our favorite character actors. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our stars are actually character actors who just get bigger roles. Mm -hmm. uh, but our they make us feel a certain way. The rhythm of their voice, uh, the look of them, how they move. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of that is natural to them. It, it's part of them. They're letting a character speak through the rhythm of their voice. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing that is really going to make you unique. Yeah. Is, is that you are allowing uh, this, this character to be filtered through your essence. Yeah. Um, in my personal journey, my, cause I was like in my twenties, I was like, yeah, the, my work will speak for myself for itself. But in my personal journey, my version of it was like 10 years later, I'm like applying to these different like programs that I would do it, like a lot of leadership programs in New Orleans. And I would just be like, I'll just apply. And then obviously my resume will like get me in. And then at some point I was like, let me tell this person that I'm applying. And then I'm like, oh, I got in. Okay. And so like uh, the next time I tried to apply for a program, I, I told somebody who was uh, associated with it, I'm thinking about applying for this. Should I? N knowing damn well I was going to apply for that. <laughs> And she's like, yes, you should. And then the first session, she's like, I fought for you to get in here. And then you look at everyone else's resume and buy on it. Like, why did you have to fight for me? I'm like much more impressive than these other people. Yeah. But it, that's how it goes sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I've been doing this for 30 years. In, well, 31 years now, Jesus, <laughs> uh, in L.A. And sometimes uh, people who are just a few years in, uh, oh man, I got audition. You don't have to audition. Even. I audition every day. You know, this is very much a what have you done for me lately business. Mm -hmm. uh, and just because you have accolades doesn't mean that they're going to hire you uh, mm -hmm. for this new thing. You have to show up again. Now, yeah, I get jobs that people just, I want Dave Fennoy on this because of a reputation because they know my work. But yeah. Not most of the jobs. Most <laughs> of them, I'm auditioning like everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, so a few more questions. Why did you start Ask Dave Fennoy anything? You know, as a way of giving back uh, to the voiceover community. Uh, one of the things I like about the voiceover community is that uh, we tend to help one another. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a way also for me to not have to have so many private conversations with people who wanted to ask me stuff about voiceover. Uh, and I'm, I'm a great believer. I'm not particularly religious, uh, mm -hmm. but I am. I like to feel spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I believe in the, the, that which you give will come back to you tenfold. Mm-hmm. So it just makes sense to me to share, 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 and and it will the good will be returned to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the interesting thing about that is like I like I got this job in animation um, ten years ago in South Korea, and I always tell people I didn't get it on purpose. I got it on accident. Like I didn't try to do this, and so like I finally put out a YouTube video, um, so I wouldn't have to say it over and over again. And then people think you're like an HR specialist. Like, so what visa? I'm like, I just got one job in a foreign country. I don't know. Oh, but what if I? Well, actually, video? actually, you know, you got that one job, but there were certain things you did, and there's certain things you realize uh, mm -hmm. about. Uh, that when you were talking about, oh, how to network mm -hmm. and rather than just apply, apply and tell people that you are applying, mm -hmm. uh, uh, get get a team on your side. You did learn that. You can share that information. Uh, the old like saying. I, 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 in the video, though. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, 
so, sometimes sometimes all people are looking for is a cosine on the thing they thought they should do anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and and when you say, oh, yeah, you, you actually should do that, and you're on a video saying that, yeah, you know, I thought I should do that. Yeah, I should do that. Um, uh, has being Black impacted your career in any way? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, you know what? I and I, I don't know that I know all the ways that it has impacted my career, but of course mm -hmm. it has. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get a lot of black roles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes but, you know, I've, I've heard I, people say that they heard a, a story from someone else, like, of oh, either reason I didn't get that was because of this. Um, well, you know, I, I, I'm sure some things have not gone my way because mm -hmm. I'm black. I don't know what they all might be. Right. Uh, but by the same token, I do a lot of general market work. Uh, and uh, just for sake of, of numbers, let's say 100 people are up for a particular role. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only black guy. Mm -hmm. Probably wouldn't work out like that. But say I'm the only black guy and I don't get it. Mm -hmm. I could tell myself I didn't get that job because they're racist and I'm black and they didn't want to listen to me. But what do the other 98 white guys who didn't get the job tell themselves? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and this is part of um, what we go through as black people. We know yeah. racism is there. We, we, something happens mm -hmm. almost every day to remind us. And yet we can't live in the, you know, I ain't going to yeah. get this because I'm black or this isn't going to happen for me because I'm black. Uh, because then it won't. It really won't. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I've learned through my career and particularly th dealing with, um, you know, different people who were, you know, very obviously racist or sexist. You know, I'm double. <laughs> so like, yeah, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but there's t like. Cause sometimes I quit, so I'm like advocating for myself, but then I don't want to hear what pe the stupid things people have to say in response to me advocating for myself. So I'll stop sometimes, but then I ramped up and started advocating for myself again, and they're like, "Okay," and so I'm like, "Oh my gosh, have I been dealing with like I've been like putting this like racism and sexism on myself?" <laughs> Cause they like I stopped advocating for myself, so a lot of stuff that I went through possibly could have not happened if I just said something. <laughs> so it's that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard being black. <laughs> right. but it's not so cool because you know we are the coolest people on the planet. Definitely. We lead the culture. Um, and, and you know what? Thank you. Bing, bing, <laughs> bing, 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 bing. <laughs> Food, music, language, <laughs> art, dance, uh, fashion. It's us, baby. It's <laughs> us. <laughs> Um, so my last question, if someone was pr producing a documentary about you, what things would you want them to highlight outside of your um, work in voice acting? Wow. Uh, probably being a dad, probably being a husband, mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, uh, my wife and I. Uh, have a foundation, Backyard Jazz. Uh, we do, throw concerts in our backyard and uh, raise money for Watts Willowbrook Youth Symphony and other uh, youth education programs for underprivileged kids. Um, I think I'd want that shown. Um, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, I, I feel like I'm a pretty cool dude with most people mm -hmm. uh i i tend to no matter who you are mm -hmm. i give you the opportunity to uh you know show up mm -hmm. great or not great but i'm a, i'm not going to prejudge you mm -hmm. or if i have that prejudgment i'm gonna say well let's put that on the back burner and now let's let's just treat this person the way i want to be treated right uh i think those things that sounds great. Um, and how can people follow you, uh, website or social media handles? Well, you can go to DaveFanoy.com if you happen to be somebody interested in voiceover. And uh, you can sign up and get reminders of uh, where I'm teaching or my we Wednesday Ask Dave Fanoy Anything. Or mm -hmm. or you can even uh, get uh, sign up for some classes uh, or private coaching. Uh, if you want to follow me, at Dave Fanoy on Twitter. Um, I'm, I'm 
also on Instagram, but you know, I, I have a TikTok. I haven't really used it yet. But <laughs> I feel like if you just like do voices that you've done in the past, you could like get a million followers. Well, you, you know what? I, I'm uh, setting. I'm about to set up a cameo thing because. Uh, oh can, yeah. Uh, so uh, I'll I'll be doing that. But uh, hey, I'm easy to find. Uh, mm -hmm. DaveFanoy.com and. Uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to hire me for your project, just reach on out. We can work it out. <laughs> I want to black animators. I want to work for you. Yes. Let's be partners in something. <laughs> and they thank you for coming on my platform and allowing me to highlight you. Oh, right, well, Deborah, you have been delightful. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, run my mouth about <laughs> my favorite subject, me. <laughs> No, I really appreciate it, Deborah, and I, <laughs> I, I, I hope I've helped somebody in some way, uh, you and and uh, whoever your audience is. Yes, thank you. And to everyone out there, I want you to like so I know it's real, comment and tell me how you feel, subscribe to Seal the Deal, and sign up for post notifications to show your zeal. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace. And you're a poet. <laughs> <laughs> I try. <laughs>